Blessing to be in front of you all this morning. We're going to start off this this morning worship this morning's worship service. There we go, singing "He's My King," because He surely is. He's my King. All day long of Jesus, I am singing. I know He's my song of joy will ever be, and all the while He keeps my heart bells for His love. Sing for His love. His love is everything to me. We're singing. He's He's my King, and oh, I dearly. I love him, he's, he's my king, no other is of all day, day long in a rapture praise I, I sing, he's, he's my savior, he's my king, well and streams of love around my soul are from his heart sing from his heart loves everlasting spring that is why my faith in him that is why sing that is why that is why an endless song i sing he's he's my king my king and oh i I dearly love him. He's, he's my king. No other. All day long sing. All day long in rapture praise. I sing. He's, he's my savior. He's my king. In his light, in his light, one day I'm going home. I will be with the souls, the souls who trust his going home, going home, going home to sing and tell, tell his story in the blessed, the blessed sunshine of his face. Sing he, he's my king, my king, and oh, I I dearly love him. He's, he's my king, my king, no. All day long, all day long, in a raptured praise, I sing. He's, he's my savior, he's my king, he's my king, we're singing. He's, he's my, my king, and oh, I dear. I dearly love him, he's, he's my, my king, no other is, 
all day, all day long in rapture praise. Oh, I sing, he's, he's my savior, he's my king, my blessed king. Well, trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God would lead us to that blessed promised land. But he'll guide us with his eye, and we'll follow till we die, and we will will understand it better by and and we're singing by and by oh when the morning and that's when all of the saints of God and we will tell tell the story how we will, we will understand it better by and by, by and by. And oft our cherished plans have failed, disappointments have prevailed. And we wandered in the darkness, heavy hearted and alone. But we're trusting in the Lord and according to his word. And we will understand it better by and and we're singing by by and by oh when and that's when all of the saints of God are gathering home one day we'll tell tell the story how we overcome and we will understand it better by and by by and temptations hidden snares they often take us and our hearts are made to bleed for some thoughtless word or deed sing and we wonder why the test when we try we will we will understand it better by and by we're singing by by and by oh when the morning comes and that's when all of the saints the saints of god are gathering and we will tell Tell the story how we owe and we will understand it better by and by we're singing by by and by oh when oh sing that's when all all the saints of God of God and we will tell how, how we owe, we will, we will understand it better by and by, by and by. Well, and there's not a friend like the Lord, lead Jesus with singing. No, not one will, no, not none else could heal sing and none else could all our souls deep we're singing and no not one well no no not one i know that jesus knows all about our struggles and he he will guide us till the day day is done well there's not a friend like the lone lonely we're singing and no no not one oh no not one i know that no friend like him is so high and 
No, not one, no, not one with singing, no, not and, and yet no friend is so meek and singing, no, not one, oh, no, no, not one, I know that G Jesus knows all about our I know that he, he will guide us till the day is done. Well, there's not a friend like the low, lonely, no, not one. Oh, no, not there's not an hour, there's not an hour that he is not near us singing. No, 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 not one will, no, not one, no night sing, no night, but his love can. And we're singing, no, not one, oh, no, no, not one. I know that G Jesus knows all about our, and he, he will guide us till the day is done, and there's not a friend like the lonely. We're singing, no, not one. We're singing, no, not one. I know that Jesus knows all about our struggles, and he, he will guide us till the day, day is done. There's not a friend like the low, the lowly, and we're singing, no, no, not one, we're singing, no, not one, I know that Jesus knows all about our and he, he will guide until the day, day is done. And there's not a friend like the lonely. And we're singing, no, not one, no, not one. morning. We want to thank Brother Sebastian for those songs this morning. Happy Sunday. It's the fourth Sunday, so we are almost into the second year of 2022. Seems like it was just yesterday, yeah. right? Welcome everyone to the Bedford Street Church of Christ. Um, it's so good to see everyone, especially if you are visiting. Um, welcome. And if you are here in person or uh, joining virtually, welcome. This morning's call to worship text will be taken from the book of Psalms, chapter 29, beginning at verse 1. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. If you could, please rise and repeat after me. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Let's bow our heads. Close your eyes.
Father in heaven, we come before you this morning, lifting you high over all and lowering ourselves. Father, we pray that we can continue to keep the focus solely on you. We pray that this worship service will be pleasing and acceptable to you. Please help us to keep our minds clear. Please help us to focus solely on you and to block out any distractions that we bring with us this morning. It's in your son's holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen. The Glory Land Way. The Glory Land Way. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. Well, I'm in the glory land way, way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way, glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Oh, you know that I'm in the glory land way, glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way grow it clearer for I'm in the glory land way, glory land way. You should listen to the call, the gospel call today. Get in. The glory land way, glory land way, wonders, wonders, come home, please hasten to obey, for I'm in the glory land way, glory land way, I'm in the glory land way, oh, I'm in the glory land way. Heaven, heaven is nearer and the way grow is clearer for I'm in the glory land way, glory land way. We're singing onward. I go, I am rejoicing in his because I'm in the glory land way, glory land way and soon I I shall see him in that home above. Oh, I'm in the glory land way, in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer, heaven is nearer and the way grow it clearer for i'm in the glory land way the glory land way i'm in the glory land way glory land way sing i'm in the glory land way way heaven is nearer and the way grow it clearer for i'm in the glory land way amen shelter in the time of storm shelter in the time of a storm the Lord's our rock, in him we hide. He is a shelter in the time of a storm. Oh, secure whatever it be tied. He is a shelter in the time of a storm. I know that Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A weary land, yes, a weary land. My Jesus is a rock in a weary land. He is a shelter in the time of a storm. He is a shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the 
No fears alarm, no foes of fright. He is a shelter in the time. I know that Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land. Yes, a weary land. Jesus is a rock in a weary land. He is a shelter in the time of a storm. Don't you know that the raging storms may around us be? God is a shelter in the time. We will never leave our safe retreat. He is a shelter in the I know that Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land. Yes, a weary land. Jesus is a rock in a weary land. He is a shelter in the time of a storm. I know that Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land. Yes, a weary land. My Jesus is a rock in a weary weary land. He is a shelter in the time of a storm. I know that Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A weary land. Oh, a weary land. My Jesus is a rock in a weary land. He is a shelter in the time of a storm. Good morning, church. Um, Today's scripture reading is going to be taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. Again, that's Matthew, chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. It reads, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus has ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teachings, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. That was Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. May we all bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to live to see another day. We recognize that um, some of us haven't um, been able to even wake up this morning, so we're just so grateful that you allowed us to come here and worship. We ask that you be with every single one of us, all the trials that we may be going through right now, whether it's financial problems, family problems, dealing with the death of a loved one. We just ask that you be with us through the remainder of the service. We ask that you help us in our faith. We ask that you help us have a foundation that is solid because without that, our worship is in vain. We ask that you be with our manservant, that he is able to remember everything that he studied. And we ask that everything that is done today is pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We ask that you um, be with people who couldn't make it to the service um, because maybe they were sick. We just ask that you um, heal them and bring them back to a reasonable portion of health so they can come back with us in worship. Um, we ask all these things in your holy name. Amen. Our God, he is alive. We serve a living God. God isn't dead. Our God isn't fake. Our God isn't manufactured. He's real. He's alive. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tinted skies with heavenly hue and framed the world with his great might. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live and we survive. From the star God created man, 
He is our God, the great I am. There was a long, long time ago a God whose voice the prophets heard. He is the God that we should know who speaks from his inspired word. There is a God. There is a God. He is alive. He is alive. In him we live. In him we live. And we survive. And we survive. From the star God. Created man. He is our God. He is our God. The great I am. Our God, whose son upon a tree, a life was willing there to give, there to give that he from sin might set men free, free and evermore with him could live. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live and we survive. From dust our God created man. He is our God, the great I am. There is a God. He is a powerful today as he was the day you were born and he will continue to be powerful uh, I am thankful that uh, my God cares about me Amen. how about you uh, sometimes we forget God knows every one of us uh, somewhere in the scripture it says he even knows the very hairs on the top of your head Amen. and for those who don't have hair he knows the hair follicles <laughs> that you have or had on top of your head. So God is intricately aware of who we are, even sometimes when we are not as aware of him as we ought to be. And for that, we ought to be thankful. 
Uh, it is good to see those of you who've come out to be in worship service on this day, especially those that we haven't seen in a while, those who are visiting with us, those who are recovering from illness, illnesses. Uh, we are thankful that God has restored you to a reasonable portion of health, and you're able to gather with the saints on Sunday. Uh, there is nothing like coming to Sunday worship. Now everybody will be saying amen on that one. You all be standing up clapping on that one. There's nothing like coming to Sunday morning worship. And when you miss, you miss. Uh, nobody can give you a summary of what happened. It, it's just not the same. Uh, that's been my experience when, when I have not been able to be at the services. And you appreciate people telling you what went on and whatnot, but until you're in the midst of it, uh, you just don't know what you miss. Uh, as has already been said, we are thankful for those who are joining us through uh, the streaming service. And if you are a member of the Veterans Street Church of Christ, we're going to ask if you log in so we know who is uh, viewing us, especially those who are members of our congregation. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to shepherd those folk who can't physically be here. Uh, but when we look at the stream, and I look at the stream, and I, I look at the remarks that people make, because uh, I want to know uh, who is actively participating even virtually. We all need to be held accountable. So if you're not at Matthew chapter 7, please go ahead and turn there. We're near the end of the chapters. We'll be starting with verse number 24 and end with verse number 29. You guys know we have been dealing with uh, the last few verses in Matthew chapter 7. Uh, we started with uh, verse, uh, verse number 13 because this is at this portion of Matthew 7, where Jesus is extending the invitation. He has preached a sermon on the mount that goes all the way back to chapter 5, and he has said some powerful truths. He says some things that would have been foreign to the audience that he was talking about, and if we tell the truth, some of them are still foreign to some of us even today. But they are truths that are designed to help us to understand how God wants his people to live and conduct themselves. God wants us to live in the supernatural not the natural. Now, you live in the natural on your own. If you're going to live in the supernatural, you've got to have God in your life because that means you've got to do some things that goes against the grain. You've got to do some things that everybody else is, uh, around you is not doing. And you've got to do it and be okay. I, I keep reminding us, Christians are not supposed to act like the world. There ought to be a difference. And as we uh, uh, live the way Jesus has called us to be, some people are going to get mad at you. They're going to get envious at you. They're going to call your names. They're going to think you think you're better than they are. And you've got to live with that and move on. Yes. Because that's not our motive for that. We're doing that because the king of kings yeah. has, con uh, has commanded us to do some things that are just different than what other people. And so I say that for, for, for uh, parents. You've got children. Uh, that uh, don't like being different than the other folks that are around them, help them understand if God is in your life, yeah. you're going to be different. Yeah. And it's okay. You don't have to get caught up in doing whatever because, you know, everybody's doing it. You guys remember that when you were in school? Uh, uh, you go to your parents, I want to go to the dance, I want to go to the event, I want to do this because all my friends are doing everybody's doing it. But we're God's people, so we don't have to do what everybody else is doing. As a matter of fact, uh, parents, you need to put some limits on some of the stuff your children do. Okay, didn't get much help from parents on that. Uh, you'll appreciate that if you help discipline them while they're young so you don't have to go to the jailhouse to get them out. Because some of our children, they're not leaders. They're followers and they're easily influenced. And some of the people who they think are their friends really uh, do not care about their well-being. And so when you raise a child who's not confident in who he or she is, and, and they got to go along to get along because they want to be appreciated and liked by everybody, uh, they may find themselves being influenced into doing some things that our God has commanded us not to do. That gave you enough time to get to verse number 24. The Bible says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. 
But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. We all like the sand. You don't want to live on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, the text says, and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. This morning I want to talk from the subject, how is your spiritual house? How is your spiritual house? In our text, we have two builders that are building houses, but their foundations are quite different. Jesus reminds his audience in these verses, you need to do something with the information that you're hearing. And as Jesus uttered those words to his audience that was present on that day, I challenge us to recognize when you're in the worship service, when you're hearing the sermon or when you're in a Bible class, you need to recognize God expects us to do something with the information that we're hearing. Not just let it go in one ear and then out the other. And not to just sit there and say, oh, i got to sit through another sermon for another 45 minutes. But to be actively engaged because you understand the value of the words of Jesus. Now, some of you will go uh, to lectures if you're in college or at school, and your teacher talks for an hour or longer. Yeah. And you there. You don't fall asleep. You don't fidget. You don't get up and go to the bathroom. You there. Because you see value in sitting in that class and getting the information because test is coming. You want to get a good grade. You want to get a degree, you want to graduate or whatever. Why don't we have the same kind of devotion and focus when it comes to sitting in worship service? Because I'm looking out now and see some of your eyelids are getting kind of heavy already. And we haven't been in worship service that long. So, so pinch yourself. Those of you who need to go ahead, just pinch yourself. Pinch yourself right now. And just stay away for another 30 minutes. And then you can fall asleep. So Jesus reminds them, you need to be careful of how you are hearing the things that I'm saying because you use that to build your life on. Now, the last several weeks we have been, as I said, we've been laboring in the latter part of chapter 7. And one of the things that we learned last week uh, in the lesson that was taken from verses 21 through 23 is that all people will not be saved. Now, that may sound harsh, you may not like it, but that's in keeping with what Jesus says. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And so there are a lot of good people out in our world who are not obeying Jesus. There are a lot of good people in our world who are doing good things, but they're not lining their life up with what the word of God has to say. And for those of us who are Christians, we believe we need to follow Jesus. We believe that Jesus is Lord, and whatever it is he says, that's what we must do. And it's not left to my own opinion, my own desires, my own likes. It is if Jesus is Lord of my life, then Jesus has the right to tell me what to do. And I know some of you don't like folk telling you what to do. But in this life, if you don't listen to Jesus... You're going to have trouble in the next life unless you just want to go to hell. So we learn all people will not be saved. There are many good people that are not doing the Lord's will. And that it is important that Jesus knows us spiritually. In the text last week, verse number 23, And then I would declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It is important that Jesus knows you. Now, all of you will say, I know the Lord, I know Jesus. Whether it's true or not, you say it. What's most important is that the Lord knows you. Because you do not want to find yourself on judgment day hearing what Jesus says in verse number 23. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness or sin. 
And the idea here is Jesus does not know them in the sense that they are not spiritually his. Jesus is creator. So he knows all of us from creation. He made us. But then in life, you get remade again. You get born again. You become a Christian. You change into the spiritual being. And so the question on the floor is, have you had the spiritual change or transformation that needs to occur in your life so that you reflect Christ-likeness? Because you can live your life and not reflect Christ-likeness. In our text this morning, we have a contrast being set up. And that is a contrast between those individuals who are obedient to Jesus and those who are disobedient. And we sometimes think, I got to be a bad person to be disobedient. No, you just have to be a person who does not follow the instructions of Jesus. That makes you disobedient. You don't have to be a murderer to be disobedient. Because the vast majority of us would not murder anybody. At least not with a weapon. Exactly. <laughs> now, we, we may murder them with our tongue. But th there's a contrast here between the individuals who are obedient to him, those individuals who are disobedient. And what we learn from just the reading is that both groups hear the word of God. H have you ever been uh, in a setting or in a discussion where we're all hearing the same information, but we come away with different recollection of what was happening? And you ask yourself, were you, were we in the same place? Or you, you go to the movie theater with people. That's good. You go to the movie, and you're watching the same movie, you're sitting in the same theater, and you come out and you're discussing, and somebody's saying some stuff, you say, now where was that in the movie? Did I go to sleep? Because we bring our own interpretations into, into some things, and, 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 and sometimes that, that shades the original message that we're supposed to hear. Both individuals here are building their life. And the issue becomes, what are you building your life on? Are you building your life on something that's solid, that will not move? Are you building your life on shifting stuff, opinions, personal preferences, hearsay, sand? You guys have walked on the beach, and you know how sand shifts you visit the beach. Right. You don't live on the beach. <laughs> you guys just came from Hawaii a few, a few months ago. I'm sure you walked on the beach and felt the sand between your toes. <laughs> <laughs> and that was nice for a while, but you had to come back to Boston. <laughs> where real life. <laughs> so so you, 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 can, you, can, you can get beside yourself on the sand. Because it's so pleasurable. But then you got to get a dose of reality when you come back to real life. And so the question is, how is your spiritual house? Look at the Sermon on the Mount. I'm just going to highlight some things that Jesus said. Because when he talked about these sayings of mine, you need to know what he's talking about. He's talking about the material that he's been talking about. So in verses 3 through 10, he gives the Beatitudes. He, he gives information on these are the attitudes that people who follow me ought to have. And these attitudes are different than the world. Blessed are the poor in spirit. We don't think of being poor as a blessing. But Jesus says, when you have the right attitude, that's a blessing. Blessing for those who mourn. We don't view mourning as something to be happy about. And what Jesus says is that you ought to mourn over your sin. And stop patting yourself on the back about how good you are. Because even though you do some good things, you know you do some bad things. And he just goes on with these beatitudes, the attitudes that we ought to have. Verse 13, he says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Is it then good for nothing but to be trodden out and trampled underfoot by men? He talking to his disciples and said, you ought to be influencers in the world and not the world influencing you. Now, I said something there. We ought to be influences of the world, not the world influencing us. And too many times we let the fads and the fashions and the opinions in the world change what we say we believe. 
because it's more socially acceptable. I want to be politically correct. He says, verse number 21 of chapter 5, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But, who, but whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. So he contrasts, you have heard, don't kill anybody. But Jesus wants you to know the way you talk to folk, the way you treat folk. See, some of you are murderers right now, and you don't have no blood on your hand. But you have assassinated folks' character left and right, going and coming. And because you didn't kill them and lay them out, you think, I didn't do anything wrong. Verse 27, you have heard that it, was, that it was said to those of old, you should not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You haven't physically done it, you just thought it up here. That's why you need to be careful of the music you listen to and the TV programs or movies you watch. Because some of you are easily influenced by that stuff, and it takes you to places you ought not go. But you say, I haven't done it. What about up here in your thoughts? You have heard, verse number 38, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. We like hearing stuff like that. <laughs> I'm going to treat you the way you treat me. Look at verse 39, but I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you, slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. I know those fighting words for some of you. <laughs> if anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Jesus says, you have heard, you can, you can treat folk the way you have been treated, or the way you perceive they've treated you. Jesus says, you need to not retaliate. Now, that's what he says. How you do it, that's a whole other story. But he's letting us know how we ought to respond, how we ought to treat people. He says, where is it? Verse number five, and when you pray, verse number five of chapter six, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But, when, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Don't be braggadocious. Don't be praying just to be seen. Don't be using words you can't even pronounce, <laughs> let alone know what they mean. Don't put on a show in your prayers. And, and, and so for those of us who lead public prayers, you, you need to think about this every time you get up here. Don't get up here trying to use words that in your average conversation we've never heard you use. He gives us the example in later in chapter 6 of the model prayer, which is a prayer to help us to know what the content of our prayers ought to be like. He doesn't give us this prayer in Matthew chapter 6, uh, starting in verse number 9, for us to literally pray those words. It is a model. It is an example. He even says in chapter 6, verse number 25, don't worry. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Don't worry. We sometimes forget Jesus has told us, do not be worrying. Worrying is a sin. And we act like worrying is a virtue. It isn't. Because when you worry, you take your eyes off Jesus. You and I can't fix nothing anyways. You should have known that a long time ago. 
That's why we trust him. Then he says in verse number one of chapter seven, judge not that you be not judged. For with that judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your eye? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And so I just highlighted just a, a few quick things that he had, Jesus has said in his sermon. And so you have to know as he is saying that, he was convicting some folk out in the audience because they had been doing just the opposite. And so when we get to our text, he helps them understand, depending on how you are responding to what I'm saying, you are building a house either on rock or on sand. So our response to what the word of God has to say determines where our foundation is. And so if you've been avoiding what the word of God has to say, running away from it, twisting it, then you're building on the sand. If you have been accepting what the word of God has to say and trying your best to live it out, then you, you're building on the rock, the solid foundation. But you got to recognize we're building one or the other. So back to our text, verse number 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on rock. It is wise to follow Jesus. It is wise to build on the rock. It is wise to listen to what Jesus has to say and do something with it. All of you are hearing me uh, right now. But some of you are hearing me already with a closed mind. Some of you have already said, I'm just waiting for him to finish so I can go home and eat lunch. See, you have missed your blessing already because your focus is on the wrong thing. You need more than physical food. Some of you already ate breakfast. You're not starving now. So you can go another four or five hours without another physical meal. Yes, but when you don't have nothing else going on in your life, you think about eating all the time, which is why many of us are overweight. Look at what Jesus uh, says in 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, and the verses are 3 through 6. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. Now by this we know that we know him. How do you know you, that you know him? If we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who abides in him ought himself also to walk, just as he walked. So if you're going to say you know him, then you need to ask yourself, am I keeping his commandments? Not just the commandments that I like right, right. and the ones that I feel is easiest to do. Right. But are you working as hard as you can, putting forth as much effort as you can to keep all the commands that you are aware of? He says, verse 5, but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. And so one of the reasons people aren't growing like they ought to is they're not taking the word internally, applying it to their life, doing something with it. It's one thing to just hear it. It's one thing to even just read the words. But it's a whole other thing to say, I'm going to do something with this. And I need for us to understand the word of God does nothing for us if all we do is just read it in the book. If all we do is just hear a sermon or hear a Bible class, and then we go back uh, and live our lives as if we didn't hear what we heard. 
Now you're a hypocrite because you're play acting. So in, verses, in verse 24, we have somebody who hears the teachings of Jesus and who does something with it. James reminds us that we need to not only be hearers, but doers. James 1.22. So the question is, whenever I am learning something about God, am I doing something with that information? The, the quickest way to retain stuff, to keep stuff, is to do something with it. Yes. You want to learn a foreign language? Instead of just listening to the tapes and all that kind of stuff, you got to go talk it. Yes. So go around some people who, who talk that stuff all the time, and now we're going to see if you're listening to these, these tapes or you're going on YouTube or whatever has helped you out. Because if you don't, you'll soon for, forget it. I told you guys when I was in high school and college, I took French. Made A's in it in high school and in college. I was even in a, pro, in a, in a play where I spoke French. <laughs> Y'all just that good back then. All I can do now is just look at the words. I said, I used to know what that means. So maybe I need to go to France. And maybe, maybe that'll re, re, uh, bring it back to memory. But I know the reason that, that I can't do anything with it now is that I have not kept on using it. Same thing happens with us, with the word and what we're understanding. If you don't do something with it, you're going to lose it. If you don't practice loving your enemy, do you really think you're going to love him? So it's about listening to the word. It's about doing something with it. And when we do that, we're building our life upon what we're hearing. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse number 24. The Bible says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? If we're going to follow Jesus, then the first monster we got to tame is self. Yes. See, if we can get self under control, we can get self uh, out of the picture. Now we're ready to follow Jesus. He says you got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. We have been running our lives for so long. That's what makes it difficult for us to deny self. Uh, that's why a person can say, I deserve a vacation, even if you don't have vacation money. <laughs> and you know what's going to happen then? You're going to rob God. The money you ought to be given, you're going to rob, you're going to take that and go on your vacation. I've said before, do not go on vacation with the Lord's money. Don't buy a new car with the Lord's money. You're courting disaster when you do that. But we got to get self under control. So when we study the scripture, we listen to the words of Jesus, you can't help but understand that Jesus wants a Christian to yoke up with another Christian. But if you don't deny yourself, you'll yoke up with anything that appeals to you. And then you wake up one morning and discover, I can't even stand this person. But if you had stayed with the words of Jesus, you would have prioritized whoever I yoke up with has to love God like I do. But when we come to dating, we don't think nothing about is he or is she a Christian? Is, do they look good? You know, how much money they got? What kind of job they got? All that stuff that's saying. Because after you get married and into, after a few years, you need somebody you can have a conversation with. Not argue with all the time. Somebody you have a conversation with. Somebody you got some things in common with. Not a competitor. So as we build our lives according to the word, that means daily application. Each day I need to do something with what I'm learning from Jesus. Put forth the effort. And the more you do that, the more you can see 
transformation in your own life. Nobody has to tell you about it. You will see how I'm responding differently. So it's daily application. It's denying self. It is developing faith or trust in Jesus. Do you trust Jesus more than you trust yourself? Uh, yeah, I figured everybody would say yes to that. Okay, but is, on a practical level, is that really true? When you have problems in your life, how do you try to solve them? Do you solve them by getting on your knees and talking to God, or do you go out and try and fix it yourself? And then when you can't maneuver, then you want to talk to God. Why not talk to him first? Because you may discover if you talk to him first, then all these other folks, you don't need to get their two cents. Because you recognize their two cents really doesn't amount to much. See, if you're always going to people who got as much problems as you, who's got more drama in their life than you do, who can't even tie their own shoes, how do you think they're going to help you? But we do that. We go to folk whose life is just raggedy. And part of the reason we do that is because we know they're going to tell us what we want to hear. You don't talk to a spiritual person who's going to point you back. Now, what did the Bible say? What does the word of God say about this? You already know the answer. We want to go to somebody who's going to give us uh, uh, an outlet or a loophole. When you do that, you're building on sand, not on a rock. Notice in, in verse number 25, for the guy who built his house, or the lady, man or woman, the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat on that house. But guess what we learned about the house that's built on the rock? The text says, it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. It was founded on something. So when you establish your life according to the word of God, that does not guarantee you won't have any problems. What it does guarantee is that when the problems come along, you got somebody in your life named Jesus who's going to help you get through your problems. So you don't have to compromise. You don't have to, have to hook and crook. You don't have to do anything dishonest or immoral uh, to deal with your issue. You trust him and simply follow the instructions he's given you. See, see, if you do that, sisters, you won't get with a man just so he'll pay your bills. See, if you do that, brother, you won't get with a woman because you want to cook your meals. That, that's what all these restaurants are for, to get you some food. <laughs> and so we go into relationships for the wrong reasons. My point is, don't be surprised when chaos happens. If you don't love him, you don't love her, you don't need to yoke up with him. Because you're going to get tired of tolerating them. So, verse 25. Problems, rain, wind, water, all that happens to the house on the rock, but it does not fall. And you and I need to be thankful for that. But look at verse 26. But everyone who hears these sayings, again, hearing these words, and does not do them, will be like not a wise person, but a foolish person. See, it's Wisdom to follow Jesus. It is foolishness not to follow him. To be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. So the person who's building on the sand is someone who hears the teachings of Jesus but doesn't do anything with them. The person is inconsistent. They're not a priority. Uh, they follow them when it's convenient. And when it's not convenient, I just do what I want to do. And we have too many people who think they are committed to following Jesus, but they pick and choose when they want to follow him. Right. You, you, you can't follow him just when things are good. You got to follow him even when things are bad. Right. So even when you get laid off, you still got to follow him. Yeah. Even when you test positive for COVID, you still got to follow him. Yeah. Yeah. Even when the money runs low, you still got to follow him. Yeah. Even when your family goes crazy on you, you still got to follow him. Yeah. You cannot be inconsistent and say you're following Jesus. 
So this man has built his life not according to the word of God. And so this person lives for today, right now. What's in it for me? Spiritual stuff is not important. And they don't trust Jesus. Look at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. There's a story here about a guy who had a little bit of something, something. But, but his attitude is wrong. Luke chapter 12, we'll start reading with verse number 16. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater ones. And there I will store up all my goods, all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But see, everybody got to meet God. Verse 20, but God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then who will all these things be which you have provided? Interesting. So, he, so he's blessed with abundance. You don't see anywhere in here where he, he says, I'll share this with those less fortunate. I have all that I need. So when he says, no, I'm going to hoard this. So, so it's all, already outgrowing the barns that I have. I'm going to tear them down and build bigger ones so I can store more stuff. And then I can just retire, eat, drink, and be merry. And the text says, the Lord says, your soul is required. Now, whose stuff this is this going to be? So I, I'm not against preparing for retirement. You know, your 401ks and your IRAs and your stocks and your bonds and all that kind of stuff. But has it ever dawned on you you might not live to enjoy that? You're killing yourself for it, but you may die, and the people you're going to leave it to are not going to treat it like you would have. Put some trust in Jesus. Not only put some trust in him, do the kinds of things that Jesus would do. In America, we don't understand you are blessed to be a blessing to other folk. And you don't have to be a billionaire to understand that concept. You just have to be someone who God has provided sufficiently for and you got excess. And when anytime you guys start thinking, well, what am I going to do with this excess? And you got all these people who are around you who are without? It says that our outlook is not right. Now, I appreciate, uh, that's why I appreciate when, when you ladies, uh, a few years ago you, you established a sister's closet. Well, you brought all the clothes that look good in your closet, but you can't wear them anymore. And you bring them and you exchange them and people uh, get clothes that are in their size and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so those possessions are now helping someone. Because you could have just let them hang in the, in the closet and say, oh, I remember when. <laughs> I remember when I could fit in that. But instead of living in the past, you say, okay, let me donate this. Let me give it to somebody who can benefit yes, from sir. this. Yes, so just like the person who built his house on the rock, verse 27 says that the person who built his house on the sand also experienced some problems and some challenges. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And unlike the house on the rock, the text says this house fell. Not only was it a great, well, not only did it fall, but it was a great fall. So, so too many times when people ignore the word of God, they launch out in places they shouldn't go. When problems come, they fail. And not only do they fail, it's a grand fall. That everybody looks at you, everybody sees the consequences of not following Jesus. 
you and I need to recognize that all lives are going to be tested. We are all going to go through stuff. If you live long enough, you're going to get old. The only way not to get old is to die young. So you're going to get old and you're going to have health issues. You're going to get arthritis, possible diabetes. You're going to need some glasses to help you see. Some of you are going to need some teeth to eat your food with. You're not going to have the same strength level that you had before. That's going to happen. But you don't give up on God because that's happening. You recognize that no matter what state I'm in, God is still with me and he's going to allow me to thrive. So even as you get old, you can still be of use to the kingdom. So the question becomes, as we go through our trials, what are we going to do? Are you going to stand tall or are you going to fall? Because it's easy uh, to go through life and say, well, you know, I don't have what I used to have and I can't do this and all that. But what can you do? Yeah. Anybody remember that poor widow? All these other people walking by uh, and dumping large sums in the collection plate and she just puts in her few mites. And Jesus says she has done more than all the others. Jesus values our sacrifice. Other people may look down on it and say, well, it's not that much. You're not giving to please people. You, we are doing what we're doing. We're serving to please God. Because sure enough, the trials of life are going to happen. Becoming a Christian does not immune you from life's problems. Christians get laid off just like non-Christians. Christians have heart attacks just like non-Christians. And the list goes on and on. They're just things that happen because you're alive. The issue becomes how I respond to them. I don't act like I don't have no hope. I don't act like I've been deserted. So when you get your illness, God is still good on the day you find out you got a terminal diagnosis. He's still good. He's still good. Because for some of us, getting that kind of news helps us to start living like we're supposed to. Because when you can do it on your own, oh, I got all the many years that I want, then you just do whatever. But when, when you get the sobering news, okay, you got two or three years. You now evaluate your situation. And maybe that will motivate you to get some things right with God and with other people that you have been saying, oh, it's not all that big deal. Verse 28, the Bible says, verse 28 of chapter 7. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. So the Bible calls attention to the fact Jesus has shared all this information, been very clear in his teaching, and you don't see anybody responding to the invitation. What you see are people who are astonished. They are amazed. They say, that was a great sermon, Jesus. Those were some good words that you said. But nothing in the text says that anybody did anything to show that they heard it and that they were going to change their lives. They just said, I hadn't heard anybody talk like that before. Wonder where he got that information from. And too many times we get distracted by those kind of things that we just watch and listen. But we don't watch and listen with the intent of learning and doing. Because every time the word of God is preached or proclaimed, there's a lesson there for each of us. If we are willing to listen and have open ears and get the sleep out of our eyes. But the text just says, the people were astonished at his teaching. And then it adds, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. There is always a response when the word of God is preached, taught, or proclaimed. It is not always a visible response. But people are responding based on their attitude, based on uh, their thoughts. And so you will have people who, when the invitation extended, you have people who will obey what they are hearing. 
they understand that the words require action. And so they do what the action requires. And then you have those people who are here, uh, who will hear and say, I'm not ready. Not now. Uh, I've I, I got a few years. I, I need a few years to get my, myself together. I, I'll do it down the line, but not right now. I've got too many more important things. Uh, you remember in, 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 um, in a couple of the gospel accounts, uh, Jesus invites people to follow him, and they say, not now. I got one I got to go bury my father. Another side, I, I, you know, I bought some land. I need to go look at it. Another side, I bought some oxen. I got to go try it out. All of the excuse making. And what they were saying is not now. People don't recognize not now sometimes means never. Then you got somebody who said, I'm good. I'm okay the way I am. You actually have people who think they are okay the way they are now. They don't need Jesus. They got it all together. Now, that's somebody who's blind to the spiritual things. They believe what they're saying. It's just that we all know we need Jesus. That's everybody. The rich and the poor, the black and the white, the pink and the green, the big and the skinny. We all need Jesus. Then you have people who have a more intellectual response who want to debate and discuss stuff. So if, you, if you've ever tried to teach people the gospel, have Bible classes with you know there's always one or two that just want to debate. And if you're not careful, you'll get caught up in debating with somebody who has no intentions of obeying anything. They just want to challenge you intellectually to see what kind of arguments you can come up with. You're not helping them, and you sure not helping you yourself because you will end up getting mad and saying ungodly stuff to this person you're trying to teach because you let them get on your last nerve instead of recognizing this is not debatable. It's black and white. You can read it from whatever translation you want to read it. It's still going to say the same thing. So either you want to follow it or you don't want to follow it, but we're not debating it. And so in verse number 29, we learn that Jesus taught with authority. He knew what he was talking about. And I will just drop this while I'm here. When you talk to people about the scriptures, know what you're talking about. Amen. Don't be parroting something you heard somebody say or, or something you pulled off a blog on the Internet. Know what you're talking about because in today's culture, you start telling folks stuff, they're going to ask you some questions. And if you don't know what you're talking about, you're going to be embarrassed. And you're going to lose uh, what little potential you had to maybe influence a person. Text says he taught with authority, not like the scribes. So the scribes had to quote other people. They had to use what other people said to bolster what they were saying. That Jesus taught with power and authority. Jesus was God. He didn't have to quote nobody else. He simply just shares with them what the word of God says. And it caught the people's attention. Now, again, many of them were just simply amazed. They didn't do anything with it. When the word of God is taught, it has power. When it's taught properly. Uh, it, the word of God is not confusing when it's taught properly. People know exactly what it says. So what do you do? with the words of Jesus when you hear them or when you read them. Because what Jesus is calling for here is an individual response. Are you going to listen to Jesus even when other folk in your house don't? Because some of us, uh, we, 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 we're in this group stuff. We've got to study the Bible as a, as a family. What happens if your family doesn't want to study the Bible? Okay, come on. Uh, all of you do not live with folk in your house who want to study the Bible with you. So when they, when they say, no, I don't have time, I want to watch my favorite show, what are you going to do? I hope what you do is say, okay, well, I'm going to study the Bible. Because my relationship with Jesus is not based on you. It is based on my submission to him. And if you feel like a change of mind down the line, I'm ready to study with you. 
But let's just recognize that everybody in our universe is not going to feel the same way about Jesus and about the words of God that we do. Amen. Now, I need to help some of you parents understand, stop giving your children so much freedom when it comes to learning about Jesus. Our job as parents is to train our children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So you don't give a child the option of whether or not they want to come to Bible study. I think I said something there. Some of you are raising rejects, dropouts, soon to be drug addicts, soon to be single parents because you're not putting the word of God in them while they're young, while you have control over them. And in 10 years when they're haywire and you come up here crying and want the church to pray for them, I'm going to say, nobody else is going to say, I'm going to say, why are you saying something now? Why didn't you come up 10 years ago when you had the ability to influence their behavior? And now they're just as big as you are and think they're just as grown as you are. They're not going to listen to you. Those of you who want to challenge me, I'll be around after worship service. I said because I've seen it too much. Uh, children uh, come to church service, they get about 12, 13, and I talk to parents, where's your child? Well, they didn't want to come today. I don't understand that. Well, I understand it, but I don't understand it from an experience situation. I didn't have that choice. It was never even a question. You just knew Sunday was coming. Get your clothes together. If you want breakfast, you need to eat it because at a certain time we leave in. And I don't think I turned out that bad. As an adult, if we're going to hear the words of Jesus, one of the things that we need to do is pass it on yeah. to the young and immature. Yeah. You know children only want to eat what they want to eat. So if you left it to your children, they eat candy all day long. Wouldn't eat any vegetables. Junk food. You know they need some vitamins and some nutrients and all that other good stuff that you get from solid food. Let's pass on the solid word of Jesus to our children. As I conclude, let me give you these four thoughts. You and I are laying a foundation every day. Whether you realize it or not, you're laying the foundation. We're laying the foundation by how we're living our lives, how we're responding to the word of God in our lives. And you and I need to recognize that the word of God has something to say about all aspects of our lives. There are principles in scripture, if we really understood them, that will help us when it comes to looking for a job, looking for a mate, where we want to live, what we want to dress, how we want to talk. We just think we can just do whatever we want to do. Well, you cannot do that if Jesus is Lord of your life. He gets to dictate, give you guidance, give you directions, give you commands, whatever terminology you want to use. And how we respond to that determines the foundation we're building. We need to be building on the rock, not on sand. Ask yourself, what type of listener am I? Do you listen to things that you don't want to hear? Uh, the reality is, there are going to be times where you're going to be in discussion, you're going to be in a situation where you're going to have to hear some things you don't want to hear. And the reality is, some of the things we don't want to hear, that's exactly what we need to hear. Medicine does not always taste good when you're swallowing the pill, but it's good for you. And you go to a doctor that you don't even know. He writes his prescription. You, you don't, can't even pronounce the word. You just take it to the drugstore, to the pharmacist. Uh, they put some pills in the bottles. You don't even know if they put the right pills in there. But you simply follow whatever instructions they give you. Why don't we have that same kind of loyalty to Jesus? Because we got a question. Well, I, I, I just, I, no. <laughs> it doesn't mean that. 
But we don't say that again to our doctor, to the pharmacist, or to the dentist, or to the eye doctor. Would you mind if I got an eye doctor appointment <laughs> next month? And I'm trying to figure out how to get out of it. So that's an inside situation to those who are part of our congregation. I hate going to the eye doctor. And I'm always looking for ways to cancel and reschedule the appointment. So pray for me that I keep my appointment. <laughs> how important are the words of Jesus to you? How, how important are the words of Jesus in your life? If they're important, we'll read it. We'll study it. We'll meditate on it. And we will ponder, how can I be where Jesus wants me to be? Versus saying, that's too hard. I can't do that. You and I grow through the difficult things that we do or go through. Those things that breed character, not the easy stuff. And the final question is, what is your response today? What's your response? Is your house sitting on a rock? Or is it sitting on sand? Are you a wise builder? Or are you a foolish builder? Are you surviving the storms of life? with your house not falling apart? Or are you going through the storms of life, shingles are falling off your house, paint's being ripped off your house, roofing is about gone, you, you got leaks in your house, Tur uh, pest control needs to come out. What's happening with your house? Is it leaning in the direction of falling? Is the foundation sturdy? There are times where we just need to be gut level honest with ourselves about where we are. A and not worry about the crowd, what the people are going to say. You know, I've been here for a long period of time. If I make a confession, if I make a prayer request, they're going to look down on me. Uh, you you got to stop worrying about that kind of stuff. Amen. You're trying to build a house that's going to last, that's not going to crumble. You either recognize people who are going to talk about you, they're already on sand. A person whose house is on a rock understands the need for public confession every now and then. They understand the need for a prayer request every now and then. They understand you mess up every now and then. And that doesn't make you a bad person. It just makes you a person who trusts in the Lord. And we need to see more examples of people who trust in the Lord. So as you ponder the lesson this day, do you have a prayer request that you need to make? Do you have a confession that you need to make? You know the answer to the question. God knows the answer to the question. For those who are streaming, if you're at home and you have a prayer request that you want to share with us, please go ahead and send your prayer request in through the uh, church email so that uh, at the appropriate time the brothers can respond uh, to those requests. Uh, we may have someone in our audience, you know that... You're not a Christian, and you need to get right with God. The best thing that any of us can do is get right with God. Become a part of God's family. Submit to Jesus. Acknowledge, I want to line up my life with his life, and I want to walk in his footsteps. Now, in order to do that, you've got to get into Christ. Scripture will remind us that in order to get into Christ, you've got to be baptized into him. And once we're baptized into Christ, we're Christian. We're a member of his church. And once we're a member of his church, there's safety and security. But we gotta wanna be on Jesus' team and be tired of being out there by myself. Anybody tired of making mistakes and getting in hold out the hole and not knowing how you got there? Maybe you ought to give Jesus a, a try. He won't lead you in a hole, I can guarantee you that. And he won't leave you out there by yourself when you get in trouble. Even if you disobey him, he's waiting for you to repent. And he'll take you back as if you didn't do anything wrong. 
This day, if you need to respond to the invitation, please do so as we stand and sing. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rains came tumbling down. Oh, the rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the wise man's house stood firm. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand, and the rain came tumbling down. Oh, the rains came down, and the floods came up. The rains came down, and the floods came up. The rains came down, and the floods came up, and the foolish man's house went splat. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the blessings will come down. The blessings come down as the prayers go up. The blessings come down as the prayers go up. The blessings come down as the prayers go up. So build your house on him. Good afternoon. We have a few prayer requests this morning. The first one coming from Sister Luna Char Charles. She's thanking Brother Davis for the for the sermon today and asking that she that Asking for spirit for her spiritual, asking for prayers for her spiritual life that she be able to develop mental and spiritual fortitude, authority over her choices, and a consistency in her spiritual journey. We also have a prayer request from Sister Janet, requesting prayers for for Kimlin, Diane, George, who is ill, and for her grandchildren who are being distracted and are not focusing on their spiritual growth. We also have a prayer from from Todd. He's asking for prayers for um for his sister Sherry Ann. Um, as she has a long road to recovery after she has suffered a serious stroke, which led to brain surgery. But, she, but she, he's also thanking God for her ability to, to gain her, her speech back and ability to eat and swallow. And one from Sister Wakeesh Charlie, thanking all who called, text, and inquired about herself and Tristan. Um, they are glad to be back in church and appreciate the, the church family for all their, their loving care. Also going from Sister Oliver, she's praying for, pr she asked for prayers for her daughter. Um, she's having surgery on Friday. Also go with prayers for her daughter-in-law who lost her, her mother from complications of COVID. Heard the prayer request, let us pray. Thank you, Father, we thank you for allowing us to just be here this day. We thank you for the, the lesson that was preached, God. We thank you for allowing it. Thank you for you allowing it to, to touch the hearts of, of those people in the, in the audience, God. And, and we pray that they, that they be able to build a house on the rock. Um, so that, that we have a firm foundation and that allows us to be able to be in you at all times, no matter what come, no matter what, what rains come in our lives, God. Um, we we also give him prayers for those um, who who are whose families are dealing with health issues, God. We pray that you just be with them. You allow them to to have comfort in in these moments, God, and that you allow th those who are who are um, going through these health issues to to be able to to get to a reasonable proportion, proportion of health, God, and be able to be um, who who you who you would have them to be, God, in, in this life, God. We also pray for those um, who are who who just have recovered from COVID or recovered from any ailment. God, we pray that thanking you for you seeing them through those because we know there are many people who did not make it through, but you allow them to. So we're grateful for, for you bringing them back into our presence today, God. Um, we we pray for for those who are been distracted, um, and have not have focus on their spiritual journey and spiritual growth. We know that you you are you you hold the way. Um, to everlasting life, God. So we pray that that you allow them to get back on the on that path to everlasting life. To remember that you are you are the one true God, the only God that that allows us to be able to to have everlasting life and to be called righteous. So allow us to be able to allow everyone in here to be able to to, to just cast it all onto you, God, so that we be able to be who you've called us to be. 
Once again, we pray that you be with all, all those who had a request, who had a request, God, and you just allow them to the request to be heard and to be known that you work in the, those those individuals' lives. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, pray and give thanks. Amen. There's much to do. There's work on every hand. Hark the cry for help comes ringing through the land. Jesus calls for reapers. I must act to be. Who read to thy own master? Here am I, send me. Oh, here, here am I. Here am I, Lord, send me. Oh, here, here am I. I am ready at thy bidding, Lord, send me. Afternoon, everyone. We have come to the part of worship where we get the opportunity to give back to God. And as we focus our minds on that, I'd like to read from us from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. It says, When King David dwelt in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within curtains. I think this passage for us gives us a kind of a mindset and an attitude which we should have to giving back to God. Recognizing how God has blessed us over and over should push us to have that, that, that desire, that zeal to give to him. So when we have this opportunity each first day of the week to give back to God, we should come rejoicing having the opportunity to give back. Let us give. There's the plaintive cry of mourning souls distressed and the sigh of hearts who seek but find no rest. They should have my love and tender sympathy ready at thy bidding. Here am I, send me. Oh, here, here am I. Here am I, Lord, send me. Oh, here, here am I, I'm ready at thy bidding, Lord, send me. Let us pray. Great God and Father, we are truly thankful to you for your many blessings, for the many chances you give to us, O oh God, to sustain this life. We pray, Father, that you'll always help us to look to you from whom our blessings come, and to be, O oh God, be happy at opportunities to give back to you. Pray, Father, that you'll grant wisdom in the spending of these funds, that they go toward the broadening of your kingdom. Through Christ's name, amen. As we move to our next uh, act of worship, which is the communion, where we get an opportunity to remember the sacrifice paid for our redemption, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, I'd like to read, from us, read for us from Galatians chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. It says, But when the proper time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born subject to the regulations of the law, to purchase the freedom and to redeem us and to atone for those who were subject to the law, that we might be ad adopted and have sonship conferred upon us. Every time I read this passage, I think about the right time, when the right time was come. And then I reflect on passages like 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, which tells us that this plan to redeem man was in place before the foundations of the world. And then I think about Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 40, which says all those great leaders, Abraham and all the prophets, that God says the blood of Jesus Christ was necessary because they wouldn't come to perfection before us. And then I read about 1 Peter chapter 3, 18 to 21, that Christ died for the sins of the world, and that Christ went and preached the souls in prison, that those who were living before the flood have a chance to be redeemed. Christ's blood was retroactive all the way to the beginning and continues toward to the end. I said, whoa, what an awesome sacrifice we are benefiting from. 
So when we come to partake of the communion, let us not consider it a common thing, but recognize it is the death of Jesus Christ, the death of God that came to earth, that subject, knowing fully well what that sacrifice would be, but was willing to go through that sacrifice, not all of us, but more importantly, me, you, an individual, can hold claim to the opportunity to be reconciled to Jesus Christ. So let us think on these things as we now commit to memory, or we continue to remember the sacrifice paid for us. Let us pray. Great Almighty God, Father, each time we come and we think on the sacrifice paid for us at Calvary, Father, it causes us to tremble. It causes us, O oh God, to reflect. It causes us to, O oh God, recognize the awesome love you have for us. Help us, O oh God, as we partake, that we, O oh God, will not treat the sacrifice paid for us as a common thing, but, O oh God, we recognize the awesome privileges we have to be reconciled with you because of that sacrifice. We thank you, O oh God, for going to Calvary, and we pray, O oh God, that you will bless the unleavened bread representing your broken body and the fruit of the vine, your shed blood, that you bless us as we take, that we do so in a way pleasing to you. Through Christ's name, amen. O Lord, O Lord, O Lord, you Restore me, singing, oh Lord, oh Lord, Lord, oh Lord, you restore me, oh Lord, oh. restore me i'm not worthy i'm not worthy oh i'm not worthy i'm not worthy but you restore you restore me i'm not worthy i'm not worthy of your mercy i'm not worthy of your grace i'm not worthy but you restore you restore me i'm not worthy i'm not worthy of your love i'm not worthy of your favor i'm not worthy but you restore you restore me call his name jesus 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 oh jesus 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 i love jesus 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 because you restore you restore me his name is jesus jesus oh jesus 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 you restore you restore me we're singing oh lord oh lord lord oh oh lord you restore you restore me this ends this portion of the worship afternoon. Um, we have a visitor with us today and make sure that I don't say your name wrong, Emensi from Northeastern. <laughs> Welcome. And Emensi doesn't have a church home, so we pray that you enjoyed the worship today and hope that you come back with us again. 
A uh, couple of announcements today. State of the Church is this afternoon at 4 p.m. That's the State of the Church today, this afternoon, 4 p.m. And the next uh, next Sunday is the fifth Sunday, so uh, no 8 a.m. service. We'll have one combined 11 a.m. service and then uh, 3 p.m. evening service. So next Sunday, remember, fifth Sunday fellowship. All right, and uh, please be standing for a prayer request. bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you once again that you have allowed us to come together to worship you in spirit and in truth. We just thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord, and just pray, O oh Lord, that our worship was done in spirit and in truth, O oh Lord. We pray, O oh Heavenly Father, Lord, that if we have sinned against you, Lord, that you have forgiven us of our sins and, and our trespasses. And we just pray, O oh Heavenly Father, Lord, for your man servant who has delivered your word today and stated that we have to, we have to build our house upon a rock, O oh Lord. And we just pray, O oh Lord, that these are the things that we do, Lord, that we will continue to build our house upon this rock, Lord, that we may continue to serve you and honor you as always, and that we will also continue to grow amongst each other, and that we may love one another, O Lord, and that we may go out into this world and preach your gospel, O oh Lord. We pray, O oh Heavenly Father, Lord, that you will be with us throughout this day, continue to protect us, guide us, and strengthen us. In your Son, Jesus Christ, in the holy name, amen.